We are finally at episode 15, which we actually had a bet a long time ago that we'd never make it this far. So I am uh, happy to say that we both lost and won at that. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, for those of you that come each week, you will know that we now have a new timeline when you first walk in. That timeline is in development. This is the first draft. And if you notice all the yellow little sticky notes that are sitting on the counter there, um, if you guys have ideas for big milestones in the community that we missed, um, you know, whether that be companies or things or anything, any, even anything small and funny that just sticks in your mind and it seems really reminiscent of our community, like write them on those sticky notes and then just put it on the wall. And uh, you know, throughout the weeks, we're going to be working with wall 360 and uh, we'll be getting more and more of those and we wanted to thank Stuart from Walls 360 for donating the uh, graphics for all the logos that are up there right now and um yeah, and, and if it is your company and you want to make a small donation to him, uh, we recommend like a $20 donation, but that would just go to Stuart for uh, his time printing this for our community. So so that's it. Keep an eye on the timeline. And then I wanted to thank the person that brought us the beer, or the company that brought us the beer, which is Work in Progress. So if you guys remember episode, yeah, episode 13, we had, I think I got that one right, but episode 13, we had Zach Ware in here. In fact, let me just read this, their mission on their website is that uh, they want to provide startups and creative thinkers with the tools to inspire creativity and innovation. Um, and at the core, the work in progress is a community of co-working spaces. So there's multiple locations. And when you go in there, you'll find that it's a great vibe for just uh, getting work done, for meeting other people that are working hard. And uh, for freelancers, startups on a budget, um, it's the perfect atmosphere. So tweet at work in progress. Uh, and thank you for the free beer. And check out workinprogress.lv. to get started with a great group. We have Adam, we have Melissa, and uh, we have Keller here from Remotive. But I want to start the conversation by talking about this Entrepreneur's Organization Award. Uh, three of our own from Vegas Tech are there receiving that award right this minute. Entrepreneur of the Year is Amy Jo Martin. Um, yeah. Woman Entrepreneur of the Year was Jacqueline Jensen. Right from Titty Cake, our own. And then Startup Entrepreneur of the Year is Natalie Young from EAT. So next time you see those guys around the community, pat them on the back. Um, and then um, let's talk about South By. What were the real takeaways that this community had? Well, Vegas Tech was actually number one trending for South By on Twitter, right. which was amazing. Like, I forgot the numbers, like 4,000 or something ridiculous. So I was just like, all right, that's awesome. And it was fun, like, walking around and hear, hearing just random people talk about Vegas Tech. Just like, oh, Vegas Tech is throwing a party. We should go check it out. Or Vegas Tech, have you heard about this startup or this startup? Because we're plastering everywhere. Right. But <laughs> I think the coolest thing was people telling us to stop tweeting about Vegas Tech because we were tweeting <laughs> so much about it. So uh, like a huge shout out to Gabe and to yeah, Ann absolutely. and to Mark yeah. Johnson and to nice. Fuller Street and everybody that put that on. I mean, it really, the whole community came together. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, we're swag, guys. Yeah, <laughs> for you, for us. And, and I think they succeeded in the goal of like making sure that everybody knows that Vegas Tech is real and that it absolutely. is something really special and it is happening. So. Um, we also have videos on the website where we did interviews in all sorts of ways. We have uh, Susan Hinton's interview. Um, we have Nina has a yeah Nina over there. She's got a video there too where she went out and found out what inspires people in the community. And then I did some interviews with all the Vegas tech startups and many of the other ones in the convention center down at South by. So check that out too. And then uh, let's talk about Startup Weekend. I think you've got something to tell, right? Yeah, we're very excited. Uh, Switch is going to be sponsoring the next Startup Weekend, May 3rd through the 5th at the Innovation Center. Nice. We're really excited about that. Congrats, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Switch is just an amazing community sponsor. They sponsored Vegas Tech. They sponsored uh, Startup Weekend. So we're really excited about that. Again, May 3rd through the 5th, we really want to get developers, designers, and anybody who's got a startup idea out there for that. Um, and then actually, what we're doing this time is we started doing a thing called Start You Up. It's a boot camp. And we're doing that two weeks before, and we're doing that with the Luxor team. And it's really to help people who have a startup idea but have no clue what the next step is to go from startup idea to startup ready in five hours. So that's going to be on Saturday, April 20th, over work in progress. We're in progress is sponsoring that so there'll be some food it's gonna be a great event um, and we're really looking forward to kind of getting more people off the sideline who've always had great ideas for startups but are literally paralyzed right. in the like, idea of like well what's the next step so that's what this camp is for it's 
it's $10. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, we really want to get people out there, get more people involved. April 20th, work in progress. And then May 3rd through the 5th, startup weekend at the Innovation Center, sponsored by Switch. So we have a lot of great things going on for starting ideas and starting businesses. And who knows, maybe you could be the next launch key. Yeah, who knows? Maybe right? the next remotive. If you're really lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to set the bar that high. I think that it'll really, you know, people will feel realistic here. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay, so Keller, we... I think I can speak for most people in the audience that were sort of bittersweet. It's sad to see that your company's leaving, but it's also amazing that you guys are doing so well and to be moving to San Francisco to handle all that growth. But uh, give us like a candid understanding of like what's happening inside uh, your head and what's happening inside the company right now. Um, you know, so our vision as a company is to build the world's first affordable personal robots. Um, that's what we started off wanting to do about a, a two years ago when we launched our initial Kickstarter campaign. Um, we actually launched that Kickstarter campaign because we had a lot of really smart, rich people who were trying to get to invest in us, telling us that it was a terrible idea. It was, you know, Roma was just a toy. No one was going to put their phone on a robot. Um, <laughs> and, like, nobody was going to buy it. And so when we heard that, we were like, wow, oh, man. You know, we must be like the only geeks around. And so we ended up putting it on Kickstarter and then we're shocked to sell well over $100,000 worth of robots. Um, and then it was like, oh my God, we have to build robots. And Tony was, <laughs> Tony was kind of like, well, I have an apartment. Um, <laughs> and so we took him up on it and we, we came here and we completely trashed the apartment. Like I, I, I posted some, some photos um, in my letter to the Vegas community. Um, but you know, since then, over the last year and a half, we've grown from three people to 20. We've hired people both um, from Vegas, uh, uh, you know, engineers from Vegas, uh, business people from Vegas. We've also hired people from Boston and San Francisco and New York, and actually had them move here to, to join us. And so a year and a half ago, I wouldn't have been able to predict that we would be 20 people today. It seems insane. Uh, and so it's definitely bittersweet for us, too. Uh, you know, as, as, as CEO of Remotive, like, my job is, is to make the decision that is going to allow us to fulfill that big vision of, of right. basically building personal robots. And f we, we're very much of the opinion that we don't need another like, Instagram for pets. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> right, like right. someone needs to step up to the plate and build hardware, like build the really hard stuff. We don't think that the future looks like Apple building the hardware and everybody else writing apps on top of it. Right. Um, so. You know, for, the, for, for that reason, um, as we grow from about 20 to 100 people, we're going to be really, really dependent on robotics expertise. Um, and because of Stanford, the Bay Area is one of the best places for that in the world. So um, just based on our need to hire a lot of people with a very specific um, uh, uh, you know, skill set, mm -hmm. uh, we really have to be in the Bay Area to do that. And because culture is so important to us, that's another thing that we learned from Tony. Because culture is so important to us, we're not willing to to split the team. Like, we all have to be in the same place. Okay, and what plans do you have to keep that kind of, like, do-it-yourself mentality that you've had that's made you so successful so far when you move out there? So, um, the thing that's always been really important to us at Remotive is that everybody, not whether, whether you're a hardware engineer or a software engineer or whether, um, you know, you're the person who uh, uh, packs the robots and walks them to the post office, everybody should have the ability to build stuff with their right. hands. And so we have a 3D printer that we have here in the Ogden. Don't tell Gary. Uh, we, we tried to get a CNC yeah. mill up the elevator, but got caught. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a joke. We didn't actually try to bring a CNC mill there. But um, we, we, we love the idea of having a space where people can actually come in and create and where we can invite people from the community to come and create. And so when we go to San Francisco, we're looking for a really rough industrial warehouse where on an upper floor we can have the software team working and on the lower floor we can have a whole bunch of machines. So we can actually just build stuff and prototype it and rapidly look at different kinds of robots and different, you know, di just, just uh, uh, different ideas and actually hold them in order to figure out whether they are, um, uh, you know, doable or not. Right. And then uh, for the last thing I want to talk about is uh, tell us about your um, experience being on the TED stage. Something that Tony talks about a lot is that uh, what defines great companies uh, or what separates them from good companies is their ability to capitalize on luck. Um, mm, and right. so I think that we didn't deserve to be on that stage more than anyone else, but uh, certainly when the opportunity was given to us, we really wanted to make a very clear statement about what we believe in and what we're going to spend the next 20 years of our lives working on. 
Yeah, it's serendipity in a nutshell. So, yeah. All right. Well, we really uh, have enjoyed having you here, and hopefully, we still be around for a little bit longer, right? Like, yeah, what's we're going to be around right until now? June, and I'll be out here okay. like every single month after that. I, we okay. we personally believe in what Tony's doing. I know he's going to be successful, um, and for that reason, you know, it, we think about it a lot, like the way Google thinks about hiring employees. When they hire employees, right. they're not like. They don't hire someone because they think they're going to be there for the next 20 years. They hire people on the assumption that they're hiring people who may very well leave the company in two or three years. But the, the point is, when those people leave, they go and like take Google culture um, to different places. And then Google tends gotcha. to invest in those people. Yeah. A lot of times, Google buys those companies, and those companies end up uh, basically sending employees back to Google. And so I think that as Vegas tech grows and as the Vegas community grows, like that's how we want to be a part of it. Right. Um, I think we're the first, and certainly not the last. As companies grow, their needs are going to change. They're going to want to go different places. But the point is that if if, if those companies can take a part of the, like the Vegas tech culture and also just a knowledge of what's happening here, it can it can uh, just raise awareness nationally yeah. and make the project more successful. Okay, sure so. will. Sorry. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate cool. you coming on. Thanks. So. <laughs> yeah, we've had a role model up here for a little while. So. Yeah. All right. We'll see you. Thanks, Kelly. David Gould here. He's the associate director at the University of Iowa, and he created a lot of courses that help higher education, or sorry, help explain to students how a higher education's role in helping students might mean more than it has in the past. It might be about finding meaning and finding purpose. This includes a course called Life Design that attempts to rethink the way college students learn and stay motivated. David has received numerous awards for his outstanding teaching. And beyond that, he's also president of Shadowbird Productions, a production company that has also received many awards, and including an Emmy for outstanding achievement in his documentary, Two Sides of the Moon. So please put your hands together for an always smiling David Gould. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay. So we had one of the longest pre-interviews ever because you have so much in common with us. So let's <laughs> let's try to keep focused. But I really want to start this talk by talking about life design and how we can rethink education and what you've actually been up to. Well, um, life design was about three years ago. It was an experiment uh, to rewind it. Uh, at the University of Iowa three years ago, we were at the bottom of the Big Ten in retention. And uh, what troubled us the, the most about that was that these were students that were viable, um, students that were doing well academically, but some reason about the time they hit the oh, second semester, sophomore year, early junior year, they decided to drift away. And I um, went to coffee with our associate dean and uh, she challenged all of us to, uh, to begin to think of ways that we might be able to, uh, to help that. And when I when I'd thought about the problem, um, you know, I mean, money is certainly an issue for college students. Uh, you know, the average college student is uh, graduating with about a $30,000 debt. Uh, you know, so I, and so some of them I know have six-figure debts by the time they get out of undergraduate. But, uh, but I, I can't do a lot about that. But there was a second tier of students, um, those students who intellectually understood why they were in college. Mm -hmm. uh, from the time gotcha. that uh, somebody walked them into a kindergarten room, uh, they knew that uh, the high, didn't end at high school, that college was the ticket they needed to be successful. But, um, but there wasn't an emotional connection. They sat in classrooms that, uh, that were uninspired. Um, they often were uh, taking subject matter uh, that really wasn't a, a good fit. And, um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because, uh, because of that cost factor, because of the acceleration of trying to get through and not, uh, you know, not be burdened with, uh, with what college might do. Uh, some students jump in without taking the time to explore. Um, but also there's, uh, there's students that, uh, that are afraid to, uh, to pick a practical major. Um, so they become a business major instead of an art history major. They become right. a computer science major instead of an anthropology major. And the, uh, the experiment, the bet was, that, um, that if you took young people and if you used the college institution as a laboratory and you, uh, and you had them explore um, where you can be an English major one day and a philosophy major the next, uh, at, the, at the window of life where it's appropriate, that uh, those students who intrinsically found what they were meant to do in the world um, would inevitably work harder, they would become better at it, and that they would find a way that it, it fit um, into the outside, the other side, if you will, and um, 
and they would succeed better than those who were extrinsically throwing a dart at a uh, moving job target. Right. So that's where Life Design was created to try and do. And our connection to Vegas is, is that on the third day of class, kind of uh, to use to Tony's word serendipitously, uh, Tony uh, drove through Iowa City and uh, actually met with our students, and that was uh, that was the spark that uh, that took it off. Yeah, well, one of the best parts about talking with you today is that you're not just going to tell us a story about a lesson you learned. You're actually going to leave us right in the middle of something that's going to affect everybody in this room. So let's jump to um, why you're out here and why you brought all these students out here with you. Well, it's a, it's it's interesting. So if you take that group of students I just described. Um, an interesting thing happened, uh, fast forward to let's say this spring, uh, the first uh, you know, crop of those students were starting to now get ready to graduate. Um, and I found them sitting in the same seats that, uh, you know, that they'd occupied when they were kind of searching for themselves. And what they would do this time is they'd sit down and they would say, uh, you know, that, gosh, you're right, this is a wonderful place. I found what I love to do. I found mentors that, uh, mentors right. that, that could make a difference. But um, but then they would pause and they would kind of take a deep breath and they would say, uh, you know, but the question is, what's next? And, and I realized that one thing that was missing in my thinking is it's, it's terrific to know what you love to do, kind of what, what, you, what you get passionate, what kind of get lost in. But, um, but if you don't ever connect that to real world problems, if you don't know how you use that in the larger world, how you make a difference, then you're missing something. And so I, I proposed a second course, uh, another experimental course, if you will, that would be upper level students, uh, interdisciplinary. We have a, uh, anything from a dance major to a finance major that would work in a team towards a real world problem. And I wrote to the, the small group of people I know that could make that happen, and I received one sentence reply from, uh, from Tony Shea that essentially said, come to Vegas and, uh, and see what I'm doing. I, I came in August with my wife. We were here a week, and uh, at the end of the week, I had lunch with Tony, and that's vaulted a course of students that, uh, you know, we're now here over spring break, um, researching the community. Uh, we've taken 16 weeks to develop a project, uh, which we will build in June and July. Uh, Tony um, has given us a small budget for the students to work with, and he's required only two things. Uh, one is, is that our first step, our most important step, is that it adds value to the community, and that the second step is it's sustainable. Uh, obviously sustainable just goes without saying from an environmental point of view, but I think what he's talking about is that it's not uh, just some quick in and out, uh, a large party and event, if you will. It's something that actually is a plan for how this will continue on. And so that's the that's the new experiment, the risk that, uh, that we're, yeah. we're shooting out for right now. Well, spill the beans. Like, do you have what's coming? In? What, do you, what do you think is going to win? Or like, what are you hoping for? Like, well, what have you guys learned? You know, I, uh, well, I'll tell you what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for magic. <laughs> um, every experiment, every experiment has, uh, just by its nature, has this kind of wonderful thing where there's a huge risk of failure. And that's the, that's the kind of the... Uh, the nature of experiments. You know that there's the possibility to fail. Um, but I also believe that within experiments are the only place where magic can happen. Uh, the students have spent eight weeks. I mean, uh, when I say magic, I, I also can take that in the literal sense. The very, very first class that we had uh, was a magician, a friend of mine, who came and spoke to our students and, and told an amazing trick. Uh, he could take a lottery card out of his pocket and he, can, and he can go through the room and take six of you and take random numbers and then pull the lottery ticket out and those six numbers will be on there and he talked about the three-year process it took him to go from that idea that seemed just amazing to actually yeah. make it actualize and so my students have been on an eight-week uh, trip up to this point uh, exploring and having mentors come into the room uh, we're spending this week um, really digging in and learning about the community and and while we have ideas um, the students are certainly passionate about issues we'll have to go home and digest them because uh, because to make a difference in a community you have to be here you have to talk to the people and so, you know, I, I don't mean to avert the answer, but yeah, we yeah, really yeah. are we really are going to need to uh, to take that into account and to think about what would be best. And and, and our notion is is to do something that just uh, that it comes in here as a love note, if if you would, if I could use that kind of uh, cliché term. Um, we certainly can't propose to know the basic needs from a quick week visit, but what All we right. can do, what we can do is we can take a bunch of young people that that care and come into a community and say we care as well and. 
And here is, uh, let, us, let us learn from you and let us give something back in thanks. Yeah, and I hear ratings go up when you leave them with a cliffhanger anyway, so that's fine, you know? That'll just help next episode. You have to have me back. <laughs> All right, so for your final thought, tell us, like, what, what's the call to action? Like, is there anything uh, people can do to get involved, or how can they help you collect the kind of data you want, or well, what can uh, there, we there's, do? there's several things. Uh, we, have a, we have a website, so if you Google search reimagining uh, downtown, and you'll see Iowa on, you know, the Iowa University of Iowa, um, it's hard to miss. It's got kind of an, uh, an arrow that, uh, that goes around and flashes at you. Um, if you go to that, that's our course website. There's a Facebook site and Twitter, and you can, you, can, you can jump in there just to follow us. But I also hope that you throw ideas our direction. Um, and, and secondly, my students are going to be here in the months of June and July, and I'd like them to feel this week has been wonderful. They've felt the embrace of this place. And I would like it. I would, I would, in fact, I would be grateful and in your debt if as my students walk amongst your, your, your community this summer that you embrace them and that you uh, and that you take good care of them yeah I'm sure that won't be a problem so thank you for coming out here and talking with us my pleasure thanks Looking for having forward me. To it, so. thank you thanks Dave off with something for the kids. For those little creators out there, bring them to the Create Your Own Short Film Skillshare on Saturday the 30th starting at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. at the Downtown Construction Zone. They'll explore ideas for the film, storyboard location, scout, and go with teams to shoot the films. Each child will even get their own DVD of the films after the class. It's for kids 8 and up and be sure to learn more and register for the class on Skillshare.com. For the other creators out there, or those looking for a new way to find some peace of mind, check out Paint for Peace on April 1st at Las Vegas Academy. The program uses creativity and artistic expression as a way to inspire and build self-confidence. Sessions start at 6 p.m. and you can RSVP on TicketCake.com. Local entrepreneurs might be interested in the Silver State Investor Forum, hosted by the Nevada State Treasurer, Kate Marshall. Join them for a discussion on private equity and venture state capital in the state of Nevada on April 5th, starting at 9 a.m. at Wynn. Tickets are $75 and space is limited. For more information, go to hamiltonlane.cvent.com backslash NVSSOF. Downtown is always bringing with ideas, but it can be intimidating to start a new business. Attend the Protect Your Ideas Skillshare and really learn the ins and outs of intellectual properties. The class is on Thursday, April 11th, starting at 6 p.m. at the Downtown Construction Zone. Be sure to register on Skillshare.com. And keeping with the theme, join Poet Las Vegas for their final installment of the Business of Art series. This class will go over media, public relations, and diversifying your craft. It'll be held at UserLib on Saturday, April 13th at 1 p.m. Let's get back to the table and learn a bit more about this year's Solar Decathlon. Wow. All right, we got an awesome way to go out with this episode. So we have Alexia here, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the Solar Decathlon. So for all of you that haven't heard about it, it's a Department of Energy competition that is a solar house design competition where they uh, select 20 teams from around the world to compete. And UNLV is the first time in the competition and we're representing Las Vegas, so we're representing Nevada and the Southwest region yeah. to compete. Let's go. So what we'll be doing is uh, we already have been designing a, a, a solar home for the last year and a half and we're just about to go into construction and we're going to take this house that's built here in Las Vegas to California to compete with teams from Stanford, USC, Caltech, ASU, and Europeans and Canadian teams. That's right. You know, we, we heard uh, Elon Musk down at South by Southwest talking about the future of solar and it sounds like it could be one of the biggest world changing things to ever come. So how good is this team? Like, do you think they're going to be able to compete with everyone else? <laughs> I think definitely. I think we have a really good team and it's really well balanced. Um, we have about um, 20 architecture students, 30 engineering, and 10 marketing, business, and journalism students. So it's a very interdisciplinary team, and everybody's excited and working on a real-world project and applying the knowledge we learn in classroom. Okay, and then is there anything you need from these guys? Um, anybody can help, or is your team already rock solid, yes. helping any way they can? Or? So uh, for this project, we need to raise um, Still, we still need to raise three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So okay. any little wow. help would help us a lot. Yeah. And I have this flyer here. And everybody can take one. Please visit our website at solidicathlon.unlv.edu and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our official hashtag is Desert Soul, which is the name of our house. Oh, cool! So and they can see, and they can see where the house is going. Yeah, and then there's a video walkthrough where you can learn all about the design. Oh, this that's is cool. awesome. Okay. 
All right, so Alexi, we appreciate you coming out and ending our Thank episode you. 15. And to everybody who came out, the Thank audience, you. and uh, make sure to put those stickies on the timeline on your way out the door. And thank you guys for coming up. Appreciate thank it. You so much.